sorry to say that our uh, next speaker, Malte, is, uh, Reban, isn't able to come. Um, so this gives us more time to discuss with Reban. Um, this presentation uh, will appear to some as a kind of a flashback um, in as much as a lot of it is um, the practical angle to what um, Wendell said in the um, keynote about multiple hierarchies. Um, my day today, I think this one is giving up. <laughs> Like, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> um, it was a right a flashback to Wendell's presentation. In as much as um, this one will also be about multiple hierarchies and markup problems, um, my day-to-day -day work is um, a digital edition of um, Goethe's Faust, a genetic edition of this, and I'm a technical research assistant in this project. One of the main challenges of this genetic edition of Goethe's Faust is that we are trying to describe um, Goethe's text from multiple perspectives. Those are only five that I tried to represent um, in this diagram, but there are many, many more that we can think of. The two on the left-hand side, the document markup and textual markup, I'll talk about a little bit more detail in a, in a second. Um, but the general idea is that um, to deliver a really sincere um, edition of Goethe's Faust, we not only want to deliver a reading text or um, some um, story about how the text came into being, but we want to also describe things like metadata, for example, that we got from the archives where the handwritings and manuscripts are lying. Or we want to link the text to images, like for example illustrations that we have for Goethe's Faust. And more importantly, we want to, want to deliver a very faithful um, um, description of the records that we find in the archives, namely the documents. So let me just take two of these perspectives, namely the document-oriented perspective and the textual perspective of our edition, and show you some of the challenges that we have in marking those up and representing them in our edition. In German editorial theory, um, when you deliver a historical critical or historisch kritische uh, edition, you are asked to make a clear distinction between what you find in the archive, the record on the one hand, the Befund, and your interpretation of that record, the Deutung, or what we could simply say, um, a clear constituted reading text. And the problem that we face um, structurally, um, I tried to draw up here, is that the reading text or the interpretation of what we find in the archives is more or less very regular. So everybody who has um, done some um, typography and, and text layout knows what's displayed on the right-hand side, namely the classical block-level, inline-level distinction of a text, that you have block-level elements that you can lay out vertically from top to bottom, and then you have inline-level elements, words, paragraphs, and all these things that line up from left to right or right to left, depending on what your writing direction is. So this is what you ultimately want to end up with. This is your textual perspective um, on the edition. What you see on the left-hand side, also a bit abstract, is a documentary view. And this doesn't adhere to this clear um, structure at all, or not necessarily adhere to this structure. Obviously, you also have certain zones or areas in the manuscript that you can um, subsume or subordinate to the textual idea of having a vertical and uh, horizontal layout. But then there are also other characteristics that you have to describe completely differently. So some areas line up in a certain way. Some textual sediments are grouped together spatially. Um, the writing direction changes, you can rotate text, for example. There are strike throughs and other artifacts that you want to represent that don't adhere to the textual order, but are more of a graphical nature. So, but both constitute or both describe in some way the same text. It's just that the one is more um, truthful or faithful to the manuscript, the record, and the other one has more resemblance of a text, the reading text. If you want to encode um, those phenomena, and here I take three perspectives, what you end up with as a data model is something resembling this and might look very familiar to you because it's a very um, common or well-known um, data model in markup theory. I tried to uh, abstract away from uh, uh, an exact text and um, take a very simple text where you just have three lines. 
that you want to describe from different perspectives. So on the left-hand side, what you see is a documentary perspective of that text. So you might have a text that um, is placed on your manuscript in two different zones. So let's say two lines, A and C, that are in the middle of the page. And then in the margin, let's say the right-hand margin, you have a third line, the so line B, that comes to stand there. And if you want to describe that spatially, you could do it in a structure like, uh, like um, printed down on the left-hand side. Now you change the perspective of the text, and you say, now what I want to actually describe is the um, content structure of the text. Let's say it's a, it's a drama or a, a verse text. The order of the text, as well as the markup, um, changes. So what once stood on, in the margin, with line B, now comes to stand between the lines A and C, because it might have been an insertion done later on in the text. That might be the second perspective. And just to add to that complexity, you could have a third perspective that now looks at the chronology of the whole act and says, OK, A and C, then A and C have been written in the first stage. Second stage, then, was, there was line B written down. On the markup perspective, and that's the, the top layer, uh, you can encode this with XML without any problems. And the data model under, underlying this markup structure is a classical DOM model made up of knots and uh, connections that you see in the middle layer. And they are structured quite different, differently. The interesting thing, though, is that all these different structures refer to more or less the same text. So our lines A, B, and C don't really change, or only change slightly, depending on the perspective. What really changes is the structure or the interpretation of that text. This data model is, um, might um, seem familiar to you because it's a classical Godard structure that Michael Sperberg, McQueen, and Klaus Hutfeld developed um, quite some time ago by now in uh, digital humanities standards. The main problem with this data model is not so much that it's not well understood or that we would think of this data model as something completely unthinkable of in terms of text, but that it's really, really hard to um, use in a practical manner. So the question that we haven't really answered yet is how do you encode such a data model in a way that is really efficient to encode? How do you process it? So what means storage data, uh, storage mechanisms like databases, query language do you use to actually um, use such a data structure? Our first problem in the edition was to encode it. So how do you encode it? The TEI makes a couple of um, recommendations how you should encode such multiple hierarchy, uh, multiple, multiple hierarchies on, on a certain text. And all those propositions are very well thought up and um, have been applied multiple times in different um, editions. But they are basically workarounds. My impression was that when you read through these different uh, propositions, and I think it's here, chapter 20, you um, can solve that problem with some trade-offs. That's what, what a workaround is about. But my main question with it is, um, first of all, in a, an addition that's really about multiple perspectives, what perspective should you actually choose as dominating one? So even if you subordinate different perspectives, let's say the documentary one or the genetic um, perspective, should the textual, really, textual perspective really be the one that dominates your encoding? And this is a wise decision, if all those different perspectives on the text actually should have their own right. And the second question that might be of specific um, relevance to this workshop is, aren't we just, just shifting complexity? So if we say on the encoding level, okay, we work around the deficiencies or the constraints of a specific data model, namely our tree-like data structures, aren't we just shifting the complexity to the processing end, where then we again have to deal with this problem in some way, which we don't see in the encoding, but then have on the processing level. So what we ended up with in the Faust edition was instead to um, do something that is also recommended by the TEI but not um, very, very popular among um, editors, we transcribed the text uh, several times. So every manuscript gets a um, uh, transcription from the documentary perspective and from the textual perspective. And then the question obviously remains, and that's the main reason why it's not very popular, how do you synchronize or how do you relate these different transcriptions of the same text? And what we turn to, and that's what I tried to allude to in the, in the title, um, what we did was we collated the text against each other. So take, take a, at first a look at it from a very schematic perspective. You have the same text, ABC, and that's first of all assume that it's really the same text. So same order of, uh, of the tokens or lines, and no difference between um, the text. Then what you can see structurally is that the text ABC on the left-hand side has been marked up in a certain way. And the same text, ABC, has been marked up in a different way in different documents. So these are the two XML documents that I have at hand. So what I really need is a correlation between the elements in both transcriptions that are actually the same. So I want to have a correlation between the A's, the B's, and the C's, so that I 
end up as a result with data model that's more complex than the isolated transcripts of my document. And interestingly, that's exactly what collation is doing. Automatic collation of text does nothing else than correlating things in a text that are the same to find out what's different. Or schematically, um, and a bit more from the perspective of collation, what it does, it does sequence alignment. On the left-hand side, you see a schematic um, collation result. Um, you have to read it from top to bottom. So you have the first text, which reads A, B, C, D, and then let's say a second text that reads A, C, D, B. And what sequence alignment algorithms do is they introduce gaps into those sequences, um, depicted by hyphens, so that the same um, tokens line up. So that, for example, we can see that the A actually is the same in two texts, or that the C occurs two times in the C. And what I also tried to, um, to show you is that um, you can actually detect things like um, tokens being moved around. So what you gain by applying collation to this problem is not only the nice effect that you can correlate things in the text that are the same, but you also get a certain kind of fuzziness or flexibility in terms of how you mark up your, your text. So in the Godard model, um, where you assume that the textual content is actually the same, so that you construct several data models or hierarchies or schemas over the same text. This is a kind of constraint that you don't necessarily have to adhere to anymore if you apply collation to the problem. Because then, all of a sudden, you could leave certain things out in one perspective. We have said in the first edition, for example, that when you have an archivist who writes down something on the manuscript, we would like to describe, transcribe that because it gives us hints about how this manuscript was treated in a, in a certain way. So it's definitely part of the text from a documentary perspective. We obviously have to leave out that part of the text as soon as it comes to the reading text, the textual tra um, transcript of it, which is still, you can cope with it in some way with, with TI markup means, but with collation it becomes much easier because all that happens in the alignment of the text is that uh, this particular part is just left out and not aligned with something, uh, some part in the different perspective. The other nice thing is that this whole problem of sequence alignment is actually a very well-known problem in computer science. So we can um, take uh, advantage of existing algorithms um, in bioinformatics, for example, or um, take advantage of existing solutions in, in textual collations for, for philologists to make that work. Um, I could show you a very short demo. Because collation is so crucial to our project, what we're actually doing is we contribute to a collation software that is currently in the works called Colidex. And there are obviously other solutions um, to that. I'm just showing this one as an example. And Colidex um, main objective is not necessarily to develop a really good sequence alignment algorithm, although that's also one of its tasks. But what we really want to um, achieve is being able to collate any kind of text, be it a marked up text or a non-marked up text, to actually achieve that kind of correlation. So what I can show you right now here in this demo is just the textual collation that you can hand in, let's say, three texts into that collator, and what it ends up with is um, a representation of the things in the text that are actually the same or that are different. Or you can get a tabular um, display of the differences and um, commonalities between the different texts. But the main point that I want to stress is you can do it automatically. So to correlate the two things, you don't necessarily have to read both texts and meticulously go word by word through it, but you can leave that task to a computer. And more so, if you can do it for XML documents or any markup document, you don't only get the correlations between the words. So your um, collator doesn't only say, chases appear three times in my manuscripts but it also tells you something about the markup context of this chases word, for example, in the different manuscripts. So you get the correlation. And that's what, what we do in the first edition. So we collate our different um, transcripts of the same text against each other and up, end up with an architecture uh, that resembles somewhat um, this architecture in, um, that you see on that slide. So instead of having a classical XML database that you would put behind a dynamic um, edition, what we actually have is a graph database where all these different um, transcripts are stored, but are not stored as separate documents like you would have that in a, uh, in a normal XML document where you would have an XML document for the documentary transcript and one for the reading text, but um, they're actually uh, stored in the graph database and they're interconnected. So we color the edges and um, one um, color more or less resembles one particular schema or one way to tra um, transcribe a text. And what the collation um, algorithm uh, lets us do is that texts are only represented once in the database. So if you have a word or a verse, it's only one of those nodes in the database and it gets referred to by different 
schemas or different ways to describe that. And now the whole problem of switching views or switching representations between different uh, data models or, or schemas of the same text becomes a traversal problem in the graph database. So I, if I want to have the textual perspective on a text, I pull, let's say, the blue colored um, nodes, including the edges, out and um, push them to the browser to display. If I want to switch the perspective for a particular word in the edition, I take that nod, go back to the graph database and ask, so in what different um, colored hierarchies are, are, are you contained and switch that perspective um, to then show, let's say, a documentary perspective or a genetic one. The main problem with this approach is um, it's nice from a modeling perspective because that's what we wanted to have or wanted to kind of achieve for quite some time to have different perspectives on texts and different hierarchies or multiple hierarchies, but it's computationally um, complex in as much as the reading of this um, structure or um, the querying of the structure works very well. Tra traversing such graphs is something that databases can do very fast by now. But what we have a problem with are graph updates. Every time we add a new perspective to the text, we have to manipulate the existing one, depending on the granularity that, uh, with which we mark it up. So one knot, um, just imagine one knot represents a line, and all of a sudden, some linguist comes along and introduces part of speech tagging, and this line gets split up in multiple words. So we have to go to the database and then split up that one knot that constitutes one line into multiple words and introduce a hierarchy, which is computationally more expensive than a different um, aspect that um, Wendell um, proposed, namely um, ranges. Ranges are much nicer in as much as you can add them to a text independently um, of, the of the structure or the, the schema that has been applied to the text beforehand. So if you say the red line is one kind of markup or one structure uh, over my text, so A and B have some markup meaning, C, D, E have a different one, it's quite easy to add a blue or, or a green layer on top of that without interfering with the existing one. And, and querying is also much easier because those ranges work very well with relational databases and existing technology. So what we're currently doing, and I won't talk about that at length because Wendell has talked about it uh, qu quite, uh, quite long and um, much more sophisticated than I could do that. Uh, I won't talk about the liminal um, uh, model and the recursive markup thing and all these things. All I want to say is we have some practical problems with this uh, graph database model that you only come up with or that you only encounter when you actually implement the model instead of just uh, thinking about what would be a proper model of um, representing text uh, in a digital medium. So our preliminary conclusions out of that um, project and maybe with reference to, uh, to this data modeling um, workshop are threefold. So first of all, modeling text independent of a specific encoding or markup format and its specific data model, in this case a DOM, will also go better with their inherent complexity. Secondly, um, the combination of established encoding practices, so we still use a TI um, and the TI encoding standards to mark up our texts. It's just that we separate different ways of de um, describing the text in the different transcripts. The combination of established encoding practices and experimental computational approaches facilitates a gradual increase in complexity. So we can start out with one perspective and say what we describe right now is a text, but we can add a different perspective later on by just collating it and adding it to the existing kind, kind of model. So we have separation of concerns, which is a really um, neat f feature of a good data model that you can separate different concerns, different approaches to the text. And the last um, point is maybe a very simple one, but one that I would like to stress. Uh, modeling text is no different from modeling in other application domains in as much as it, takes, uh, it must take conceptual as well as computational aspects into account. Thank you. Because, you know, there's, like, if you conceive of, of graph, things as graphs, and, and I think that's actually kind of something that comes up in the data modeling community. <laughs> like, I know we need a graph. Like, when things get complicated enough, you know, we go for that sort of most glorious of all data structures. And then when we go to, to process it, uh, we discover that it's, a, it's, it's the, the best way to destroy Java. For example, job virtual machine, and so forth. So you say computational aspects. I wonder which thing we're talking about. Are we, are we talking about computational tractability, which is, is at least philosophically possible for the most complex uh, cyclic graph you can name, 
Or are we talking about the practical exigencies of the systems we have now? Because that second one sounds like something we might ignore. The first one sounds like, <laughs> you, see what, you see the distinction I'm making? I mean, there's, there's sort of, there's, there's uh, are we making things that are computationally tractable? That's one question. But the other is, are we making things that we can actually build and run easily and that the programmers will kill us, <laughs> right? And, you know, and I'm wondering which one is, are you referring to in that sense? <laughs> because I heard both concerns. I mean, if you're a modeler, it sounds like, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't pay so much attention to whether my existing server hardware can handle it or I have enough memory. And yet, in practical terms, of course I have memory. I think I'm referring more to the second part. Um, I mean, the main con risk of this project uh, to begin with was to go for the um, multiple uh, transcriptions of the same text. Because already in the, in the TI guidelines, it's put down that this is uh, one of the most sincere ways of um, describing or representing multiple hierarchies of a text. The only problem is that we don't know how to correlate the different views. And therefore, we basically erase that option, and then there comes a list of workarounds how to represent that. Um, and we had to develop this, uh, this correlation approach over the project. So for us, it was, first of all, a practic practicability issue. So what can we do with the text? XML delivers for free not only encoding, but it delivers for free validation. It uh, delivers the transformation language, although not a very aesthetic one, at least in my opinion. And all um, infrastructure, uh, like databases. So do we really want to um, find a substitute for all these different offerings? Or is there an ability to gradually migrate it to something more complex? Yeah. I think uh, the, the graph, the, this, this kind of argument that this graph structure is around since the 1960s, in a sense. But um, there is an exponentially, literally exponentially growing field since 10 years, which deals with graphs. And one interesting thing, if you, if you, you know, texts are one dimensional. But yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you compare them to say a set of architectural drawings, right, which uh, basically have say two sections to a building which cross, um, and then you have to do that kind of game. Where usually art historians used to do like hierarchical descriptions of, of, of a building, which usually are like you know main building, then floors, then rooms, and whatever. Then you have you have a hard time to actually fit that, right? It's a very very similar problem. And uh, you, could, you could basically think of it like text which have knots in their string, right? So basically like genes, which are the strings which are knotted up. And then you have a hard time because the gaps will be huge. You have so many gaps that you can waste like a of the artists on gaps, right? And, but nevertheless, you could actually use that graphs and actually do some network science on it and actually measure how bad or how good you do. So for example, in this case, if your description of the hierarchy building does not fit the structure of the documents. You can actually see by the distributions on both sides, by the probability distributions, how good your, your actual classification is. Because if it's really good, it will be an exponential, and if it's bad, it will be power. And so, so basically, these kinds of things are, it's, 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 a, it's an alley we think, I think we have to go down. We have to not only measure the data, come up with a nice data model of reality, but actually then measure that data model and then say, okay, how, how good are we doing? Is there better ways? What among all the possibilities are the best examples how to describe that particular thing? I, I skipped one slide because also there's some um, copyright issue because this picture was actually drawn by Wendell in Amsterdam, I think. Um, you made that picture, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not from me and I, I left out the credits, but I, I like this picture very much. It describes all the different um, theoretical approaches to multiple hierarchies and, and mock-up um, theory in a very spatial kind of way <laughs> at, the, at that time, yeah, right? At the time. And, and there you can see that the Godard um, kind of model, the graph-based model is in, in the middle somewhat, and the range-based model are down there. But these are two main ways of describing text. And each of them have certain computational features, uh, like I tried to explain in this very short presentation. So I'm, I'm not very sure whether um, or let's put it that way, just because I can apply certain graph algorithms on graph-like structures doesn't necessarily mean that that's my main point of application for texts. I can see how if I have a graph representation of my markup, I can run these analysis, but the, um, the, the current challenges we had in the edition were much, much simpler. 
but basically, how do, are we able to write all these different tools evaluating this markup without constantly working around the milestone-based markup that the TI enforces on us? So it was a pure practicality issue. Um, added to that, um, Godard structures by now are expressed in all kinds of different formats. So there's an Italian project, for example, who tries to, which tries to express um, Godard structures with RDF. And while I don't see, really see the point in using this very verbose and um, kind of um, triple-based model to describe a Godard, they can show very well which applications they can use uh, on top of this, this model to, to make it work. It's just not, just not the representation I will use. Um, I'd like to um, uh, talk about Steve's objection about the uh, efficiency of the graph representation. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying, and indeed, uh, when I first looked at this problem of representing a multi-version text as a, as a graph, uh, I came to exactly the same conclusion as you, that you could so easily slide into a situation where you're computing an NP-complete problem, uh, and it would never, ever work. So I discarded that, and I decided to use embedded markup, and I published that paper in uh, uh, Literary English Computing 2006. Then I, had, I was shown a text by Domenico Fiormonte that was utter spaghetti. It was 10, 11 different uh, drafts, all written on the same piece of paper. <coughs> of an Italian poem, and I realized there was no way with any amount of markup and attributes and links and so on that you could possibly ever represent that. And I tried for several months to do it, couldn't do it. So I went back to the model, and I came to a different conclusion. If you constrain the graph, you can prove mathematically that you can compute it in a certain time. And the, the French who worked on this, Medit Boudaillet, who worked on this, proved that you can do it in linear time. You can merge at least two versions, and when you have multiple versions, the worst is quadratic you can get on log n for the merging operation using a greedy algorithm. Now, it's true if you include the transpositions, the thing becomes NP-complete. But if you have a heuristic algorithm which gets a pretty good, pretty good fit, you can do it in very reasonable time. And I think also what he's talking, I was a little confused when uh, Gregor talked about the LMNLs in the same breath as the, the graph model. But I think if you separate the two and you use the standoff properties, which Wendell has described, uh, as a way of marking up the text in layers, Separate from the versions, you've got a complete system <coughs> that doesn't use embedded markup. You've got the versions, you've got versions of markup, uh, and that gives you a very good representation, a flexible representation, where you can have building blocks, texts, and versions to produce a, an output, which can also be efficient. You can process that Wendell's representation into uh, HTML quite efficiently. So I don't think the efficiency problem is, is a, a, a showstopper. Tree is a graph. Yes, a, tr a tree is an example. A tree is an example of a graph that we've screwed with so we don't run into NP hard <laughs> problems. <laughs> no, I understand. No, I understand. But I think that's the interesting point, right? So there is this old kind of uh, argument that uh, if a graph is too large, you have to reduce it to a tree in order to draw it or forget about drawing. Well, and that's not true. That's his point. Yeah, and, and, and that kind of a notion, which actually is done by Ben Schneiderman, one of the most famous visitation guys in, in this kind of <coughs> Park uh, review book from 1999, that is disproved constantly because the graphs we can draw are growing larger and larger, right? Orders of magnitude per year, basically. And I think that's an interesting point. So I think in terms of graph drawing and in terms of graph analysis, we are in the age of Chotel, <coughs> and we're still not at, you know, a Greco or something. Yeah, there's still stuff to come. Um, one question, Sean, do you think um, what you're talking about is a data model on the level of our researchers or any other human people from the humanities community think about the object? Or is it on a different level of what you I understand the data model being put in computer science, but would be the logical level of a data model? And, um, it, or is it, is it a proposal to switch the view of how people in the humanities should think about their objects. Well, maybe you can answer the question. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm not very sure about that because the, um, the model I used, the Godard model, is, um, has been published in 92, 93? Or, no, it's, it's, it's no, not at all, right? It's 2000, 2000 something. 2003? I'm not quite sure. You have the paper in 2002. 2002. Yeah. And so, so the model is not a new invention or something that I, where I would say this is a technical uh, kind of perspective on things, but it seems the natural perspective of 
to the humanists to think about things, multiple hierarchies addressing the same text. What, what I uh, thought of as striking is that it hasn't been implemented at that point. But that basically the workarounds are much more popular around the problem than actually finding an implementation for that very clean model of multiple hierarchies pointing on the same text. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to change direction because I, I'm like soaking all of this up and learning a tremendous amount just from the inferences. But I do think that there's a, an issue that, uh, that uh, Gregor mentioned very briefly, which I think is really important. I want to pose that as a question to you and, and to the rest of you guys who are, who are thinking about implementing this, which is um, having to do with the, with the, um, the design, the development process itself, and the workflow of the researcher who is actually investigating a text and working with it. And one of the things that you mentioned in, towards the end of the talk was that one of the things that XML in its current form gives us is that we can develop a schema and then distribute it, share it, and that somebody who's coming into this new has some guidance, has some hints, has some right, a framework that's already in place. Right? And one of the things that I think that has sort of always been working in the back of my mind is a question that I don't really know the answer to, which of course I spoke to this morning, but again, without any real, any, any concrete ideas about how this should work, is if, if, you know, if we do set aside this idea that this early commitment to the you know, monolithic hierarchy is a necessary thing, and instead begin to do the things that we, we understand are necessary in order to do adequate representations of text, then what are we going to do on this on the side of uh, you know actually building a system which allows those points of entry and that progressive uh, you know hermeneutic process of development that everybody has to go through? Um, you know, can we have schema languages that deal adequately with multiple hierarchies and arbitrary overlap, which even evades that? I'm not a big expert on, on um, schema languages, um, but the ones I know um, and that validate let's say the text that we use in the FOSS project are based on context-free grammars and on one single hierarchy that's validated. And um, so, put it another way, when I talked to Andreas Witt um, about that problem, um, and he also did a lot of research in, in, in this field, he said, if you want to have that substitute for XML as a technology, as a markup technology, you don't only have to find an encoding or um, a certain markup language, you have to uh, get the validation and the transformation language and the query language right in order to have a, have a full substitute. So just delivering um, an encoding that could possibly um, express multiple hierarchies is not enough because you don't get the um, syntax completion in XML editors, you don't get the validation part, um, all those things that we are used to by now when we edit texts. Um, my hope basically is that um, if that idea could be developed a bit further, uh, would be that this merging aspect of text would be more or less automatic, so that you would have something like a text repository or a database where you can ingest your, your texts or import them, and they might validate because they adhere to a single hierarchy, they are proper XML texts. But behind the scenes then, some um, collation algorithm kicks in and says, well, this text I have seen already, it's very similar to that other one. And then he connects the two and tells you, by the way, the, the markup you applied to your own text, to, to the one text you um, put into the system, has already been marked up um, to a certain part in a different <coughs> markup, markup system. Take a look at it, compare it. Okay. That's really disappointing. Did you mention which Query language you use for query, and the other part of the question is, um, which <coughs> kind of people have queried this resource so far? Um, Except for you. Right. <laughs> um, what kind of query language? So um, we we try two approaches. The first part, the first approach um, that we tried and that I showed you in this um, graphic here is based on a graph database called Neo4j, and so the. Tr um, um, query model that we use for that graph is traversal. So there is no inherent query language. There are query languages for Neo4j, but what we basically do is traverse a graph with certain constraints, like what edges are, are we able to traverse, what, what order of the document, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that didn't perform very well, not because it's a query. The query was actually quite fast. In normal PC hardware, you could traverse up to five million knots per second. So that went, went very well. Um, the problem was the update. So what we actually use right now is this model, this range-based model. And there um, we use a custom query language that's uh, operating on this range model. And it's basically a translator from a custom um, predicate-based first-order logic query language to a SQL 
Um, regarding scalability, I think that's what your question relates to how many persons have queried that. Um, the Faust edition currently is not live, so we don't have many users, many par parallel users um, querying that repository. But the um, source code that we use to implement that model is currently in use um, in a different project in the USA. Um, it's about um, Collation, Juxter. I don't know whether you know that Collation software. And the upcoming version of Juxter, 1.6, I think, will be web-based. So it will be a client-server solution where um, the whole collation is done on the server side and in parallel. So whether that scales, we'll see um, in one to two months because then this model basically will power the service. Can we go back to the, the other slide? Uh, yes, this one. <coughs> Can you expound without boring these people out of their minds uh, a little bit? Explain to me a little bit the relation between the colors and the Godot structure. I'm not sure I follow. Okay. Um, the color base basically ex expresses um, one single hierarchy um, of, of nodes or one um, clear tree structure of a node. So the constraint is that one color basically constitutes a tree. So multiple parentage uh, in the Godot model means that one node has a parent relationship to two different uh, to two nodes with different colors. It could be the same node, it could also be different nodes, but the main point is that the color is different. Okay. But in that case, it sounds more to me as though you have implemented multi color trees uh, in the style of, of uh, the database community than the doc structures because uh, the doc structures. Well, I may be wrong. Uh, we should talk more later. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> more comments, like, uh, more comments, mm. more, uh, questions. Yeah. 